Over the next few minutes, we're going to talk about the retroperitoneum, and specifically, we're going to talk about the retroperitoneal anatomy. For some, it'll be an introduction. For others, a review. But we'll go over the different spaces, different organs that live in the retroperitoneum, and how the different spaces communicate with one another. And the idea of the retroperitoneal anatomy is really centered around this tricompartmental model, which essentially discusses uh, this anatomy with respect to the kidney, such that the space anterior to the kidney is known as the anterior para-renal space. The space posterior to the kidney is known as the posterior para-renal space. Well, the space around the kidney is known as the perirenal space. So that's really the tricompartmental model. To that, I'll talk about uh, something called a great vessel space. And um, the reason I want to bring that up is that there's certain pathological processes that like to occur in that space. So it's important to always evaluate it um, in every patient that you see. And finally, we'll touch upon the interfascial planes. And this really brings everything together and allows us to discuss how these different spaces communicate with one another. Before we get started on the different retroperitoneal spaces, I thought it would be important to go over some of the anatomy. So we'll look at the anatomy in this axial plane. Uh, to orient everybody, this is anterior over here, this is posterior, this is the right of the patient, well, this is the left of the patient. Over here, of course, we have the ascending colon, and to the left is the descending colon. This is the uh, duodenum, and it turns out that most of the duodenum is retroperitoneal. Um, so the second, third, and fourth portions of the duodenum are retroperitoneal, while the first portion is actually intraperitoneal. So that's something that's important to know. Over here, of course, is the pancreas, and most of the pancreas is retroperitoneal. Uh, the pancreatic tail, which actually goes up into the splenic hilum, not really shown well here, so in kind of this location, is actually intraperitoneal portion. But again, most of the pancreas is retroperitoneal. The adrenal glands, right adrenal gland, left adrenal gland, and retroperitoneal are both kidneys, seen over here, right and left. The ureters are retroperitoneal organs as well. This is the IVC and aorta. These are retroperitoneal. And it's also important to know some of the muscles in this location as it delineates some of the anatomy. Here is the psoas muscle on the right and on the left. And this muscle that I'll just shade in over here is the quadratus lumborum muscle. So that's important to be able to recognize. And not shown on this uh, slice, but a little bit lower down, um, another retroperitoneal organ is in fact the rectum. But again, the rectum is not all retroperitoneal. The lower uh, one-third of it is uh, retroperitoneal. Let's get going and start talking about some of these different retroperitoneal spaces. And the first one I'd like to talk about is the anterior pararenal space. That's also known as the GI space because it contains a lot of the gastrointestinal organs of the retroperitoneum. In order to start delineating, it's important first to trace out the peritoneal lining. So here's the peritoneal lining drawn in magenta that lines the anterior abdominal wall. It's closely opposed to it. It takes a dip along the lateral abdominal wall and reflects over the ascending colon, over the uh, second portion of the duodenum, uh, way over the pancreas, and takes another dip and reflects over the descending colon and reflects backwards again to align the anterior abdominal wall. All right, so all this uh, lining in magenta is essentially parietal uh, peritoneum. So we'll do a parietal peritoneum for P and P. Next, and why I'm going to draw um, some of the other layers that uh, delineate the anterior pararenal space. And the first layer to know about is the anterior pararenal fascia. It's also known as gerotus fascia. So if we can imagine it, it's going to be right over the kidneys over here on the right side. And on the left side, it's going to be right over the kidneys as well. All right, so this white layer over here, I'll just uh, draw it over here, is actually known as gerotus fascia, or the anterior pararenal fascia. And finally, in red, I'm going to draw the continuation of the anterior uh, perianal fascia as it goes laterally. In red, as you can see over here, on the right and on the left. And this fascial layer is known as the lateral conal fascia. So now that we have all these uh, spaces, or these fascia that have been drawn out, we can delineate the anterior perianal space, which anteriorly is delineated by the posterior layer of the parietal peritoneum, as we can see over here. Posteriorly, it's delineated by gerotus fascia, that we can see over here, drawn in white. Well, out laterally, it's delineated by the lateral conal fascia, that we can see drawn in red. And of course, as we can see over here, it contains a whole bunch of GI organs, certainly uh, the ascending colon and descending colon, the retroperitoneal portions of the duodenum, which as we've uh, mentioned as the second, third, and fourth portions of the duodenum, as well as the vast majority of the pancreas, which is a retroperitoneal organ. 
And in between, of course, there's going to be some fat and some vessels. But again, these are the main organs that it contains. Uh, these are the main ones that we need to know about. So the next space we're going to talk about is the perirenal space. And this uh, is a space right around the kidneys. And it's also known as the genital urinary space because it contains a lot of the GU organs within the retroperitoneum. When we talk about uh, this space, it's important to define certain fascial layers. So one of them, or at least a few of them, we're still familiar with. So the first one is the anterior perineal fascia, or gerotus fascia. So I'm going to trace it again and draw it on the right side over the right kidney and on the left side over the left kidney. Now the posterior aspect of the perirenal space is defined by another fascial layer called the posterior pararenal fascia. So I'm going to draw it over here. It goes posterior to the kidney on the right side and looks similar on the left side as well, traveling posterior to the kidney. Both of these anterior and posterior parenal fascia join out laterally to form the lateral conal fascia, which uh, we're familiar with. So I'll draw that in red. So over here, of course, is the lateral conal fascia. This is the anterior pararenal fascia, also known as gerotus fascia. And this posterior pararenal fascia is known as the Zucker Candles fascia. So I'll just delineate that over here. So the perirenal space, of course, contains the kidney. It contains uh, the adrenal glands. It contains a whole bunch of perinephric fat that's contained in that location. So I'll write down fat over here. It contains portions of the proximal ureters, as you can see over here as well. And another thing that happens, and you see it invariably in patients, is that within the perirenal space there are these tiny lymphatics that extend to the gerotus fascia and the Zucker candles fascia. And uh, they serve, as we'll see, as potential conduits for decompression of any pathological process within this space through the different fascial planes. So let's round off the third compartment of the tricompartmental model by talking about the posterior pararenal space. And uh, this is my favorite space because it's really simple. It contains just fat. And it's a small space that's seen posterior to the kidneys. In order to delineate its different fascial planes, let's start off by drawing its anterior border. Now it turns out the anterior border of this is in fact the posterior pararenal fascia, also known as Zuckercandle's fascia. So on the right side, if we draw it in green, this is what it would look like. And on the left side, it looks similar, coursing posterior to the kidney. This, of course, is Zucker Candle's fascia over here. Posterior layer of the posterior perirenal space is, in fact, delineated by something called the transversalis fascia, which is a thin fascia that lines the muscles. So we'll draw it out here, and it's going to be seen in light blue, covering the psoas and quadratus lumbora muscles and going out laterally to the right and similarly covering the psoas and quadratus lumboris muscles and traveling out laterally over here. So in blue, of course, is the transversalis fascia. Now, just for the sake of completion, let's draw the different uh, other different planes over here. So the lateral conal fascia, of course, goes out laterally. So that's the lateral conal fascia on the left and the lateral conal fascia on the right. While gerotus fascia, as we've seen, with the anterior perirenal fascia goes anterior to the kidneys on the right and on the left. Right, so that's going to be gerotus fascia. And the posterior perirenal space which contains fat is this space over here. Posterior to the kidneys being shaded over here. It's a small space and it contains uh, a little bit of fat and in fact it continues out laterally as the properitoneal fat pad or fat stripe that you can sometimes see on abdominal x-rays. Let's move on now to the great vessel space. I'll just briefly touch upon this. And again, uh, I want to point this out because this is part of the retroperitoneum. It's a space in which you can have certain pathological processes uh, start. So it's important to evaluate and look at it on every case. And the great vessel space is really the space that is around the central vessels of the IVC and the aorta. And there are things like retroperitoneal fibrosis or uh, things like mycotic aortic aneurysms that can also uh, start in this location. And one of the important aspects of this is that this space over here is actually in contiguity with the 
uh, posterior mediastinum. So let's say if you have a process in the posterior mediastinum, it can travel in the abdomen through this space and vice versa. If there's a process in the great vessel space, it can easily go and infect uh, portions of the chest. Other than the aorta and IVC, of course, there's going to be a few small lymph nodes that uh, reside in this location, maybe a few small vessels, and of course, uh, some fat. Let's round off our understanding of the retroperitoneal anatomy by discussing its superior and inferior extent. On the right, the retroperitoneal space actually communicates with the bare area of the liver. Now, the bare area of the liver is the region of the liver that does not have peritoneal lining. So we can see peritoneal lining coming across and reflecting uh, from the right hemidiaphragm over the liver, over here and again reflecting over here. So this space A over here is actually a portion of the liver that does not have peritoneal lining and is in communication with the right uh, retroperitoneal spaces over here. On the left, it extends up to the left hemidiaphragm. Inferiorly, there have been a bunch of studies showing that there are variable communications between the retroperitoneal space and the extraperitoneal portions of the pelvis. Current theories that the anterior perirenal fascia, gerotus fascia, and the posterior perirenal fascia, the uh, zuccarocandal's fascia, are in fact sealed as they go downwards to the extraperitoneal portions of the pelvis. Now the issues with some of these theories is that when we see lots of retroperitoneal pathology like ascites or hematomas or free air, we see that there is pretty liberal communication between the different components or different compartments of the retroperitoneal spaces. And the current theory is that in fact these different fascial planes that we've been talking about are not a single fascial layer, but in fact these fascia are laminated uh, expansile planes made up of multiple different layers that allow communication between the right and left aspects of the body, the superior and inferior aspects of the body, and between the different compartments themselves. Now as a result of this to our vocabulary we've added a few different things, a few different planes, um, and this is the retromesenteric plane which is the plane that develops due to the different fascial layers of uh, gerotus fascia. We have the retrorenal plane, which is the fascial layer that forms amidst the uh, different uh, layers of uh, the zuccarocandal's fascia. We have the lateral conal uh, plane that forms in lieu of the lateral conal fascia. And as these two uh, and three actually meet and go out inferiorly, it's known as the combined interfascial plane. So as can be seen, and this schematic over here, this is the retromesenteric plane, the retrorenal plane, where they meet out laterally is actually called the fascial trifurcation. And uh, this is the lateral conal plane, and these all meet at the fascial trifurcation. And as these extend inferiorly, it extends as the combined interfascial plane over here. So again, this is the retromesenteric plane, this structure over here, this plane over here, all this area over here is the retro renal plane. So I'm going to finish off by drawing some of these fascia on one diagram just so you get an idea of how they relate to one another. So we'll start off with the parietal peritoneum which I'll draw here in magenta closely opposed to the anterolateral aspects of the uh, abdominal wall. So that's going to be the uh, parietal peritoneum. And of course we have the anterior perirenal fascia, gerotus fascia that goes anteriorly to the kidneys on the right on the left, so that's going to be gerotus fascia. Then we have the posterior perirenal fascia or zuccarocandal's fascia drawn in green going posteriorly to the kidneys. Zuccarocandal's fascia. Laterally, of course, these continue as uh, the lateral conal fascia on the right, excuse me, on the left over there and on the right over here. So that's going to be the lateral conal fascia. Finally, we have the transversalis fascia, which covers the muscles and forms the posterior layer of the posterior perirenal space. You can see here, drawn as such, over the psoas muscle on the left and quadratus lumborum muscle over here. So that's going to be the transversalis fascia. And again, it's important to remember that these uh, different fascial planes are layered and are potential spaces that can open up. The gerotus fascia over here can open up to the retromesenteric plane. Um, the uh, posterior perirenal fascia or sacrocandal's fascia can open up into the retrorenal plane. Lateral conal fascia can open up into the lateral conal plane. Um, where these three meet will is known as the fascial trifurcation, so we'll do FT for that. And as they extend inferiorly, they extend as the combined interfascial plane.